Hello, Hello everyone. <laughs> my, oh my. So good. We got you back, and it was good to see you and Allison uh, together. At that, that, I, I actually went to the Husky thing, the fall, fall, yeah. That was really neat. Yeah. Yeah, you, you two were just like hanging out there all the time. They wanted to get that poor person in the water. Yeah. <laughs> Wild. Talking about the dunking booth at the fall festival. That was pretty cool. And actually, uh, one of the one of the workers there swiped a card for me, so I was able to get a turkey leg. That was cool. And I'm glad I did because I'm not going to the rent fest, so it was nice to be able to get a turkey leg. It was pretty. It was not too bad. So. All right. Let us look at page. We left off on page four. 36, uh, the stanzas from the Grand Chartreuse. Yeah, I noticed a lot of you really took to the existential despair. It just kind of fits the, fits the age and the time. That was really cool. Oh, I know, yeah. Oh, yeah, that's true. You know what? I hate my existence. I think I'm a waste of space. Yeah, I'm, I'm amazed what people put on Facebook. What people put on Facebook. On and on and on. It's like, oh, man. Yeah, we're, we're back to the sorrows of young Verton when they killed himself and caused everybody. Crazy. All right, we're at Stanzas from the Grand Chartreuse. Let's pick up where we left off, which was line 85. Actually, that would be the top of 437, wouldn't it be? Yeah, the top of 437. Hey! Um, Hey, this is the first time we've had Amelia and Maria. Both both of you guys have been away for just different reasons. So, yay, it's a, it's a reunion. Yay. <laughs> so we're looking at a page 437, stanzas from the Grand Chartreuse. And where we left off was, remember, Matthew Arnold was there, and he feels guilty for being in this Carthusian monastery. He's not trying to join, but he can almost hear his sort of secular, humanistic, atheistic teacher saying, what are you doing? This is against everything we taught you. We taught you about science and enlightenment and all that sort of stuff. And we, we, we ended there when he says, line 85, wandering between two worlds, one dead, the other powerless to be born. That's, That's what it means to be stranded in an age of transition and unable to go back or forward. <laughs> and he's caught in between the two. And he says, with nowhere yet to rest my head, again, we said he's kind of like a Christ figure. The Son of Man has no place to rest his head. Like these on earth I wait forlorn, their faith, my tears, the world deride, I come to shed them at their side. And we said that even though Arnold is not wanting to join the monastery. He doesn't believe it. But he feels a sudden kinship with these monks because both the monks with their old supernatural, you know, ascetic faith and these old romantics like Arnold, both of them have been rejected by the world. They reject the monks as an old superstition, but they reject Arnold because they think his tears are passe, we don't need that anymore, let's keep moving forward, right? So, again, their faith, my tears, my specifically my romantic tears, the world deride, I come to shed them at their side. And then we ended with, oh, hide me in your gloom profound. Keep me here. You know, give me a little refuge from the world for a while. Ye solemn seats of holy pain, take me cowled forms and fence me round till I possess my soul again, till free my thoughts before me roll, not chafed by hourly false control. So let me stay here until I can get strong again. Let me just have a good cry. Would you just let me have a good cry? Is it really for forbidden from now on to do that? Let me just indulge and then maybe I'll be able to come back. For the world cries, and we'll pick up. For the world cries, your faith, you monks, it says your faith is now but a dead time's exploded dream. It says, boom, that's, quote, medieval. Okay, we're beyond that. No more of doing that, okay? No more lovely orthodox vestments. I heard you're an expert on vestments. I remember. Oh, good. I remember some, some rant from Dr. Bolston about you. You're, you're like really big into vestments or something like that. Yep. It's really cool. Um, um, so, so that's, that's what, what the world says, says about faith, faith, but my melancholy, my romantic melancholy, my Keatsian, Shelleyan side, Byronic side, 
my melancholy skiolists say, it's a weird word, it's probably better just to use the word sophists, uh, you know, the, 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 the smart, cynical, skeptical people of today, they look at my melancholy and they say, it is a past mode and outworn theme. <laughs> oh, that's so early 90s or whatever that kind of stuff they say today. Right? Um, they, they say, no, it, it, it's gone. Get with the program. Shake it. Remember we said it's, it's like in memoriam number 21 when that Victorian businessman looks at, at tennis and says, come on, this is not a time for private sorrow song when everything's moving forward and growing and whatnot. Uh, so, again, as if the world had ever had a faith or skiolis been sad. No, no. Okay. Now, ah... Uh, if it be past, he's the romantic now, if, if all that melancholy, if it be past, take away at least the restlessness, the pain. Be man henceforth no more a prey to these outdated stings again. The nobleness of grief is gone. Ah, leave us not the fret alone. What's amazing here is that Matthew Arnold, who's not a believer, is almost... Um, <laughs> is it's almost uh, uh, stating one of C.S. Lewis's great, great apologetics. C.S. Lewis, of course, was a long time after this. C.S. Lewis had what he called the argument by desire. He said, the fact that we desire food, that we get hungry, that seems to prove that we are creatures made for eating. Right? Now, if we're stranded somewhere, we might starve to death. Right? The, 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 the hunger for food doesn't guaranteed, guarantee I'll get it. But it does seem to guarantee that I'm the kind of creature that needs it and that something like food exists, or what is the origin of that yearning? Well, in the same way, the, re the fact that I get thirsty seems to prove that I'm a creature made for drinking. Well, unless I'm a Southern Baptist. Um, um, well, the fact that we yearn for things that our natural, physical, material world cannot supply seems to suggest there is something beyond the physical world that's the origin of that. And a lot of Lewis's arguments in one way or another are about cause and effect. That the origin or cause has to be greater than the effect. It, it, it's kind of in both. I mean, it, it, like I said, in one way or another, basically, you remember in our class, Lewis says, if naturalism is true, materialism, you know, that, if it's true, then nature is a closed system. Right? There's nothing outside of nature. So if Lewis can find anything that demands a supernatural source that will mess up that. And he finds it in morality, he finds it in desire, he finds it in reason. Uh, stuff. Good. Yeah. Right. Naturalism is self refuting. Mm -hmm. Good. You, you, you can't, to, to come up with a theory of nature, you have to step outside of nature and look at it and study it. But, yeah. Which means that the naturalism is false, because naturalism says there is nothing outside of nature. Nature is the whole show. Remember that? That's a miracle that he says that. It's all coming back. So, I don't know if it'll be a while before I teach that class again, but we'll see. Um, so here, he's sort of saying, hey, you know, if all of this has passed away, why am I still yearning? Why am I still hungry for it? Why do I still have a desire for it? Right? And, and all you do is you, you take away the the sort of joy, the fulfillment of it, and you just leave the empty desire. And he, again, he's, all of this is, he, Arnold is feeling stranded. If he, if he could just jump in and join the, the, the new Victorian spirit of progress, then maybe he could shake it off. But he can't shake it off. And, he, and that's why he feels melancholy and stranded and unable to move forward. But... If you, maybe his teachers, these scholars, the world, look, if you cannot give us ease, last of the race of them who grieve, again, who are, who are, who are the them who grieve? Those are the, those are the romantics, okay, not the monks, those are the romantics. You can't, the, you know, the, the last Byrons and Shelleys and Keatses, right? If you can't give us ease, here, leave us to die out with these Last, last of the, the people who believe. Right? Those, Those are the monks. So, Arnold, the late romantic, is the race of them who grieve. The monks are the people who believe. Leave us together. Right? Silent while years engrave the brow. Silent. The best are silent now. Leave us here to grieve together. Right? 
Achilles ponders in his tent, the kings of modern thought are dumb, silent they are, though not content, and wait to see the future come, they have the grief men had of yore, but they contend and cry no more. All of this is just, it's like, there, there was this outcry, there was this desire coming out of the French Revolution, and it's just all stagnated. Our fathers watered with their tears this sea of time whereon we sail. Their voices were in all men's ears who pass within their puissant hail. Still the same ocean round us raves, but we stand mute and watch the waves. All of it. So not only the, the words were the Coleridge, the Byron, the Shelley, the Keats, but the, the, the revolutionaries themselves, all these people who fought for a more meaningful life and all that sort of thing. And here we are. They're gone and we're just stranded. And then, it, it, again, sort of melancholy. For, for what availed it, it all the noise and outcry of the former men? The former men are the romantics and ultimately the French revolutionaries too. What, 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 about, what good did it do? Right? right? Say, Say have, have their, their sons achieved more joys? joys? Say, Say, is life lighter now than then? The, the sufferers died. They, they left their pain. pain. The, the pangs pain which tortured them remain. Remember, especially Byron, Shelley, and Keats all died young. Uh, uh, Shelley and Keats particularly were Shelley and, and Byron were particularly fighting for Greek independence Byron himself actually fought Shelley helped raise money and they were out there and, and all three of them died outside of England which is kind of interesting um, so what he's saying is they fought but all they left us was their pain are things really better are things happier more joyous right what, what helps, helps it now that Byron bore with haughty scorn which mocked the smart through Europe to the Aetolian shore the pageant of his bleeding heart? <laughs> there we go. That's it. That's what it is. They're all you know, going at they, 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 they Well, look at That thousands counted every groan and Europe made his woe her own. I just think of what Abigail just said at the beginning of all these people posting on Facebook telling their long sob stories and stuff like that. And it's like... You know, for a while, people, you know, feel sympathy, but after a while, they just get tired of it. <laughs> just stop, right? You're tired of it already? Yeah, well, my thought was, like, it's that you're so honest about your pain that you lose any sense of solemnity or, or sadness about it. That's interesting. It's like, life is terrible, I'm a terrible person, ha -ha, and then you just move on. And yeah. You like, sympathy or compassion or, or real feeling in it. It is weird. It's like, do you really want to get better? I, I just think of, okay, you remember, I think it's in the Gospel of John, uh, when there's this cripple guy and he's by the water, right? And the angel comes down and stirs the water and the first person in and he can never get in because nobody can help him. And remember what Jesus said to him? Do you want to be well? Right? And that sounds like a weird question. Do you want to be well? But sometimes people don't want to be well. We'd rather, you know, just, just keep wallowing in our sorrow or whatever it is. Good? Good? Hmm. Mm, that's true. Yeah. And like I said, what's terrible is it was already an emotional weapon, but now it's become a political weapon. The idea of victimhood has actually become a political weapon. So it's like, it's, it, it just makes it worse. It gives you more reason to just, I'm not going to do anything. I'm just going to sit around and feel sorry for myself. <laughs> Man. So he says, what boots it, Shelley, that the breeze carry thy lovely wail away, musical through Italian trees, which fringe thy soft blue Spetsian bay, inheritors of thy distress, have restless hearts, one throb the less. Now, again, Arnold feels stranded in this, right? There's this dying romanticism, but he can't get out of it in his poetry. He, he did, did get out of it in his prose. prose. And I, I gave you just a very small piece of prose to read, but I'll just explain what it is. It's an essay he wrote called The Function of Criticism at the Present Time. And I'll just sum up the, the important part, because uh, I think it's a very helpful paradigm that Arnold gave us. He breaks up aesthetic history, in other words, the history of the arts, philosophy, theology, uh, literature, uh, all those things. He sort of breaks it up into two different kinds of epics, E-P-O-C-H. And there's like a pendulum swing. Right? Remember, I already broke it up into focusing on the group and focusing on the individual. Remember how I started? Uh, when we looked at uh, Tennyson, right? we went from uh, the, the um, group and then the, the, the classical age was individual and then we go back to the Middle Ages with the group and then we go back to the individual with the Renaissance. Back okay, here he calls them Epics of expansion and epics of concentration. An epic of expansion and an epic of concentration. 
And the epic of expansion is the, is the exciting time. An epic of expansion means that society is filled with new ideas. It's just everybody, you know, thinking and dreaming, and, and, and there's just so much energy and vitality. The, the zeitgeist, the spirit of the age, right, is full of electricity. And during epics of expansion, that's when you need poets, great poets, like a Shakespeare, to harness that energy and turn it into great poetry. And Arnold only unambiguously mentions two epics of expansion. Does anybody know? What, even today, when people look, but what, what, what do they see as the ideal time period when great literature and ideas were coming? You know what? What's what's the one from the ancient world? Good ancient Greece. We call that the golden age of Greece. We sometimes also call that Periclean Athens. You know why? Good. Good, good, the Peloponnesian War. So Pericles was the great statesman who oversaw good, the Golden Age of Greece, which included not only the Parthenon, but Aeschylus, Sophocles, Euripides, Herodotus, and Thucydides, uh, Socrates, the, the young Plato. Uh, all, all of these people are coming together at the same time, and everybody considers that the sort of flowering of humanism in the West. What about in England? What is the age people always hold up more than any other age in England? Well, Victoria. Well, Elizabeth, okay? And, and most would now say the Victorian, but he was too close to it, right? But everybody would agree the Elizabethan age, when Queen Elizabeth was, was, was queen, and of course that's the age that gave us Shakespeare, okay? And there were, there were others, there were uh, Spencer. There's, we didn't really need anybody else, but we had Spencer, and we had, uh, what's it, Sidney, so Philip Sidney, we had um, uh, Christopher Marlowe. Uh, and now, now to me, I think that actually the 17th century is more exciting when we start getting John Donne and George Herbert and others. But, but still, th those are two that nobody would dispute those. I think most people today would consider the Romantic Age an age of expansion that was born out of the French Revolution. But he didn't, probably because he was too close to it. Right? And he actually says, based, he says it in the essay, but he, he suggests it here, that the French Revolution should have caused an age of, exp of expansion, but it didn't. It just it died. Well, you're a beatnik person or something like that. I don't know. I mean, other ones. I mean, certainly, I think we can we can put the golden age of Rome. That's what we call Augustan Rome. That gave us Virgil, Ovid, Horace, Livy, uh, um, a bunch of people. Lucretius gave us a lot of people. That that would probably count. Um, and, and different. I mean, if you want to really look out, there's the golden age of Spain that gave us Cervantes and a bunch of other people. Um, but. Yeah. yeah, that's you know. Sometimes people call that the High Middle Ages. You're right. That is a good. Uh, yes. Yeah. So like I said, you can identify different ones. He just focuses on the, the, the literature and the tradition. But I think, and I think a lot of would see would see the Victorian age maybe as well. Uh, you could decide whether the Jazz Age uh, might be one with uh, you know. Of course, you have uh, Fitzgerald and Hemingway and others and whatnot. And, and what's that? Bob Dylan. <laughs> It's amazing how many famous singers can't sing. That poor guy. Oh my gosh. Bruce Springsteen can't really sing either, but he's famous. My grandfather was listening to Johnny Cash, and he's like, Oh, yeah. He's a big Johnny Cash fan. He finally went, He always sings so flat. Well, yeah, as far as I can tell, Johnny Cash has a range of about five notes. I don't even think it's a full octave. It's unbelievable. A ring of fire. It's like, and it, he, gets, he gets away with it somehow. I guess because these people are really poets. That's how they get away with it, right? They're poets. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Sorry, Thomas. Yeah, wild stuff. So, so, okay, so if you don't have an age of expansion, you have what he calls an epic of concentration. And think about the word concentration more like a little bit stagnant. And in an epic of concentration, there's not, this is Arnold arguing, there's not a lot of new ideas, there's not a lot of excitement, things have sort of stagnated, and basically what he says is, even if you're a great poet, it won't do you any good, because a great poet needs material to turn into poetry. But if the material's not there, he can't do it. If you've ever heard this phrase, to have a great poet, you need the man and the moment. Have you ever heard that phrase? 
that in a way, that, that's kind of what he's saying here. You need the two to come together. Now, of course, if you're Matthew Arnold, this is a very convenient argument, because what you're saying is, well, I would have been a great poet, but I was born the wrong time. Right? I mean, you, you could call this a sort of, uh, uh, you know, making an excuse or something for himself. But this is what's unique to Arnold. He says, in an epic of concentration, the great poets are kind of wasted. So what do you need in an epic of concentration? You know what you need? Critics, very good. You need critics who will stir the pot and bring fresh new ideas and get the electrical storm going so that they can propel society back into an epic of expansion and then the poets are there. Oh, you know, that's a good example. That's true. A lot of those, like uh, uh, Truffaut, Francois Truffaut and, and others, uh, that are they're, they're people that, that's right they started as critics and they wrote that stuff and then yeah that, that is a good example actually yeah that is the 60s of course those people probably destroyed Hitchcock because Hitchcock was great until they got a hold of him and then, and then his, his movies get a little bit less good you're right he been going for a long time yeah he's been going they did though yeah no they did give him the reputation yeah, yeah. there wasn't was serious genres. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah, he still did. He was—he was just a make. He made suspense movies. Yeah. Like, I was yeah. Early in his career, yeah. 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 They got old. They—they—they they, they raised his reputation, but then it, it like went to his head. I think, and he wasn't quite as good after that. It's funny. I don't know. But you're right. He was also tired. He'd been doing it for a long. I mean, he started in silent films. Um, that's right, yeah. Black, blackmail, it's called. Good stuff. He, he, knows, he knows his stuff. I, by the way, Daniel graduated uh, on Saturday. I didn't get to talk to him. I saw him go by, but I didn't see him afterwards. So he did walk. It was pretty cool. But anyway, so... No, nobody. It, it wasn't that hot. That thing, I, I was at the 2 o'clock, and there was a lot of cloud cover. few moments were pretty hot, and then the cloud came, and thank God it didn't rain. Because you do know that those things we wear are not waterproof. Because they have velvet. Velvet would be destroyed. Yeah, I know. It, it was hot, but not... I don't know. I, I, I would think at 10 o'clock it was cooler. But the 2 o'clock was bad and then good. You know, I survived. I survived. <laughs> so anyway, but that's basically his idea. And you could call it his excuse. That he could... Because he saw himself stranded. But he does actually have some good poetry. But he saw himself stranded in that epic of concentration. And he couldn't move forward. And that's why he changed over and became a critic so that he could use his critical skills to help propel another epic of expansion. Cool idea. Oh, okay. Yeah. Critical theory and criticism works because otherwise, like, I'm, I, I'm an evangelist for Duchamp's stunt, because that's a real oh. criticism. Oh, oh. That's interesting. Right. So, I guess what you're saying that's interesting that art, art as a statement is really a form of criticism more than art. That's cool. It wakes us up to the, you know, the, the, this is just a logical outcome of the play. I mean, I, I've heard people say because you know I don't, I, you know, I, I stopped listening to music in about 1949. But the, but the, uh, but the, a lot of people say that the music that's come out in the last 20 years, there's nothing, there's nothing fresh, there's nothing new. I don't know. Is there much? Maybe slowly, but. Maybe. Oh, well, that's, that's good. Cool. Oh, that's good. Nostalgia. Maybe that's it. That's why Dr. Bolson li likes uh, The Mandalorian the most. He feels like that's, you know, almost all the Star Wars movies they've made, the new ones are just streamlined. You know, but somehow it's, it's a little more interesting. I know you're talking about music. Oh, I'm talking about music. Like the mandolin. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Oh, oh, oh that'd be cool. <laughs> the Mandalorian. Woo. Watch it. And, and a new series, of, a new season of The Crown just started on Netflix, which is really good. I just watched the first two episodes. They're really good. Anyway, let's come back. Um, okay, now. So here he is, stranded in the age of concentration, caught in the middle, unable to move forward. But then suddenly, starting at line 156, there's a ray of hope. Wait a minute. Maybe, perhaps, there's some hope. And it starts again at line 156. Years hence, perhaps, may dawn an age more fortunate, alas, than we, which without hardness will be sage and gay without frivolity. Sons of the world, oh, speed those years, but while we wait, allow our tears. Perhaps far off, like, like the beginning of the in the morning, far off another age may dawn, this epic of expansion. And what will it be like? It will, that without hardness will be sage. Let me explain what does sage mean. Not parse, wise, good. So maybe there will come an age when people can be wise without being Hard, what does that mean? Good. Good. You could be hard without being austere and cynical and stuff like that. Maybe there could be a, a wisdom that is that is joyous and more human and not... Because again, a lot of people, the more wise they get, the more cynical and skeptical they get. It doesn't have to be like that, right? So, it shouldn't. I know it shouldn't be like that. I fight again. Every time I speak uh, to, to students, I, I talk about the, 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 the dwarves in the, uh, uh, in, in, the, in the stable in the last battle. I say, okay. Being cynical is not being more wise. It's being more ignorant, right? But that's not what happens when you go to secular, you know, schools, big schools. It's like you're smart when you, when you look down, when you see through everything, right? It depends on your view of the world, then. Like, yeah. Like if you think that the world is hard and cruel, then being hard and cruel, that's true, and yes. seeing that is wisdom. That's interesting. So, you're, so it, is, it is. It's about your worldview, is it? Ultimately, that is true. You want to be in sync with that. That's interesting. Yeah. Oh, there you go. See. Like, like, do you see the world through, like, it's just facts to be broken down to, like, getting the baseline thing, or do you see the world as something that is full of wonder and mystery right. to be discovered? And, I, I mean, I think it differs, too, on, like, what do you, like, there's pain and joy in the world, and it differs from what you think is, like, the truth. Cynical people think Good. that there's a, a veneer of joy, but underneath it's, like, uh, pain, right. like reality. Nature is hard and cruel and has her claws out, versus... If you're, my God, for example, a Christian, and right. you think that, yes, there's a veneer of pain, but underneath, joy will be... There's joy, that's good. Then being wise is seeing the joy past the pain, whereas otherwise it's like, good. all this frivol frivolity is just fake, you've got to be like hard about Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. You're right, that's the, the Beatitudes call for a different, looking, a different perspective on the world. Maybe we're, we're back to the cloud and the pebble, I guess, right back to the beginning. It's true. It is like Blake, right? So maybe it'll come. So it will be, uh, hardness will be said, and gay without frivolity. What does that mean? So it'll be wise without being hard and cynical. And what else? Good, without the shallowness, the excess, the debauchery, all that sort of stuff. Right? So this, is, this is what he's looking for, that, that this is the world that's coming. Uh, these are the people who will be what? Tennyson called the what race? Remember he called it? This is the crowning race. Uh, this is what we're looking for. The, the, this is what he means by sons of the world. These are the people that are coming. The, the people that, that, um, that who was a foreshadowing of, according to uh, Tennyson. Hell, good. He was born too, too soon. He was meant to be a, a member of the crowning race, what he's calling sons of the world. But he, he was born too early. Oh, speed those years. But he said, look, while we wait, allow our tears. We're not there yet, so would you just let, let me, you know, indulge a little bit in my melancholy? Because we're not there yet. Maybe it will happen far off, right? Yeah, I guess he said. <laughs> Isn't that what, uh, that, you know what Solomon says in Ecclesiastes? You work, work, and then all your, 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 your descendants will, will, will do it. You won't even take any joy in it. <laughs> It is. I guess it's a little bit of that tone. Allow them, again, allow our tears. We admire with awe the exulting thunder of your race. Again, the crowning race, what's coming. We exalt it. You give the universe your law. You triumph over time and space. Your pride of life, your tireless powers. We love them, but they are not ours. I don't have that. I don't have your... 
your, your energy, your, 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 your for whatever it is. You, you have it. You are the people that are going to come along, and you're the ones that are going to build. You've seen old movies, you know, the, the utopia of glass where everybody's moving on the, the moving ways and stuff like that. You've seen that. Um, H.G. Wells, you know, those are, not until they became dystopias, but the utopias were supposed to be all, you know, beautiful and moving around and things like that. Uh, again, we, we, we love them. We're excited. But that, that's not us, right? So who are we? We, and, and the we is the romantics, but it could even include the, 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 the monks that are there with them. We are like children reared in shade beneath some old world abbey wall. You know, we, we grew up in the parsonage. Uh, what, are, what, are, what are some famous people that grew up in a parsonage? Actually, Tennyson grew up in a parsonage. Right? Uh, what, what two famous sisters grew up in a parsonage? Yeah, the Brontes also grew up in a parsonage. You know, there some. Um, and uh, uh, so, so again, we are like them beneath some old world abbey wall, forgotten in a forest glade, and secret from the eyes of all. Deep, deep the green wood round them waves, their abbey and its close of graves. So here we are, we're, we're stuck, we're stranded, we're, we're, we're peeping out. But every so often, while we're there, stuck on a farm in Tatooine, we look up and what do we see? Oh, no, the two sides, yeah. And what else do we see going through the sky? Yeah, starship. You see the rebels the, 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 from the rebellion going through. And we want to join, right? Or maybe you're a, you're, you're a Gascoigne farmer. And you see these wonderful uh, soldiers with their swords going by, and you want to join them. You know what I'm talking about? Thank you. Oh, somebody gets that. Yay. Okay. That's D'Artagnan watching and wanting to be one of them, right? Isn't that great? Yeah. Oh, Gascoigne, that's like the countryside. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. You're right. Oh, you know, my, my daughter, who's, you know, rather bookish too it's funny when she starts telling me names it's like what are you talking about she's never heard anybody that's why that's why no that's seriously why when I published my uh, children's novels The Dreaming Stone I insisted on putting pronunciation in, in the book and I've done that with my new one The Myth Made Fact because I want the kids to know how to pronounce them they did have yeah you should because nobody knows what to say I'm crazy Oh, that's even harder, yeah. Makes no sense. How do you say this word? How do you say this word, right? <laughs> so they, they watch him. So, or, or think of Percival watching the nights go by. Some of you read... Uh, what, what's per Percival? What, what, it's, it's, it's a Percival. No, um, no, you didn't get there yet. You read it. In, in, in the, what's that? Yeah. 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 The night of the couple. Is that all? You didn't read the other one. You should have read the other ones about Percival. Yeah, with the Fisher King. That's Percival. Did you read that? Yeah. Wasn't it? that was Lancelot? Anyway, but Percival, who you know, who eventually got the, the Holy Grail. Uh, well, in the older versions, later on it's Galahad. But the older versions is Percival. What's that? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's right, sometimes, yeah. But, but Percival is, is, again, sort of the country bumpkin who wants to become a knight. All, the, all these people that are looking at it and wanting to join, and it's, it's beyond them. So just imagine all these romantics, and they're peeping out, and what do they see? But where the road runs near the stream, off through the trees they catch a glance of passing troops and the sun's beam, pennant and plume and flashing lance, <laughs> Forth, Forth to the world, world those soldiers fare to, to life, to cities, and to war. You might, you might say that they're, they're watching the march of Victorian progress. progress. As, As they go, they're, they're, they're going by with their banners. And, you know, you, you, you probably, probably know there was a bit, bit of a medieval revival in the 19th century. We call the Pre-Raphaelites. And you, know, you imagine this image, you know, going by. And it's so exciting. Like, look, at, look at, they're going by. The circus is going by, right? And, 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 what, and they keep going, right? Through the wood, another way, the notes, right? And, 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 and skip a bit to uh, line 192. Uh, as they're going by, uh, well, I guess, it, yeah, line 192 in, uh, in, in italics, it says, Ye shy recluses, follow too. Come, come. That would be like if the, the business majors could, you know, watch us here discussing all this great poetry. And we're like, you can join us too. It's okay. Come. Is it like marching on, like super successful? Yeah, I know. 
<laughs> no, wait, that, that's it. That, that's actually you're right. That's more true. But <laughs> come now, oh children, what do you reply? And he's one of these children. Right? What, what do you say to them as they go by and say, "Join us"? Action and pleasure. Will ye roam through these secluded dells to cry and call us? But too late ye come. Too late for us your call ye blow, whose bent was taken long ago. Came too late. That sense of belatedness I talked about last class. They're not ready. What happens in the last chapter of Peter Pan? It's so sad. You read Peter Pan? Yes. In the last chapter, Peter shows up to see Wendy when she's right. back to do the spring cleaning for her. But she's grown up and has a little daughter now, Good. so she can't fly with him anymore. So he just takes the daughter instead because... Good, good, good. They're, they're, they're. Yeah, when Wendy grew up. Yeah. And heartless. See, that's the answer. The word heartless, which doesn't mean cruel, but no heart. You know, just yeah. They, they, right. They don't think about others. And it, it's, it's, it's it's a very serious ending to that. When Wendy grew up, I always remember that. That made me so sad when I was a kid. That's right. He comes back for spring cleaning, but what does time mean to Peter? Right? And now Wendy's old, right? Right. And of course, in one version, when he goes back to get the granddaughter, he falls in love with her and then becomes human and becomes Robin Williams. And that's what happens with Hook. That, that, that Peter, yeah. That's what happens. Yeah, not there. Yeah, that was, that was in Hook. <laughs> Which is kind of neat. But, but, but again, it, it is sad. It's like, it's, like you, you, it's just, you know, why, why didn't you come now? Now I'm too old. I, I can't, you know. Uh, it's, it's, it's sad. Again, they're, they're stranded. Long, Long since, since we pace this shadowed nave, we watch those yellow tapers shine, emblems of hope over the grave and the high altar's depth divine. The organ carries to our ear its accents of another sphere. There they are. They're literally cloistered in this world. Right? And then, this is their answer, fenced early in this cloistral round of reverie, of shade, of prayer, how should we grow in other ground? How can we flower in foreign air? Pass banners, pass, and bugles cease, and leave our desert to its peace. He's using a, a metaphor from gardening, and he's saying literally, we cannot be what? Good, good. So, what, 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 what's the word you would use? Because it's, it's a, it's a um, gardening metaphor. We can't be what? Transplanted. Is what they say literally. We can't. We we, we want to go there, but we, we can't make it over here. So just leave us to our desert. It, it's it's just sad, right? Uh, so in other words, uh, we get to the end of this poem. There's a sense of hope, but he can't be a part of it, right? And there is no uh, Abigail. There is no abundant recompense at the end of this poem, right? There's not. There's not a lot of hope. Uh, there, there, there's also. Uh, it, it even lacks. That last gasp of energy. You know, maybe he could have said, you and I are old. Old age hath yet his honor and his toil. Who says it? Death closes all but something ere the end. Some work of noble note may yet be done. Not unbecoming men that strove with gods. That's Ulysses, okay? He's, he's missing that. though. He doesn't have that, that last gasp of, let, let, let's go do it. Let, let's be part of it. He's too tired. He's not even that old, but he's too tired, right? So he can't. Join them again. No abundant recompense. They can't. They can't join. The, let's put it this way: they are going to be left behind in the secular. Rapture. You understand what I mean there? Okay. That the whole concept of that book, Left Behind, and the movies, the terrible movies. I don't know what's worse, the movies and the books, but the um, but the whole idea is that the raptures come, and we're left behind. But here it's a secular rapture. And, and the, the romantics are as left behind exactly. as the others are. But, but given that it's a secular rapture, it's not the worst thing to be left behind. Where it would be for like the actual rapture. Okay. I guess, yeah. I was thinking like in the way that they come on. And again, I'm thinking since he's like with the monks and their outdated right. faith, that I guess, yeah, he's, he's asking them to leave them to their grief right. and, and respect that. But like, again, in context of Tennyson as well, He's asking them to allow their grief to have some dignity. Is that Melly? Like, acknowledge that what we lost was, was worth losing. Or right. Just that it was precious to us. And, like, let us have some dignity and, and let us have our grief. Rather than just saying, nope, you lost nothing. Just move on. Ignore it. And, yeah. and there, there's no mourning for what was lost. 
So I think that that's kind of worth worth having at the end. Something. Yeah. It is good because he's, he's not going to stay with the monks forever. He's going to stay and leave. But he's just, you know, leave me alone. I, I can't join you. I know you want me to do this, but I, I can't do it anymore. And then there's not... Like I said, there's there's not as much of a resolution, I guess, because in a sense it's a crisis poem, just like just like Dover Beach. But there's a, this is just expanded, and, and I think I think this is that. I think this is one of his maybe his best poem because it it gives you a really neat uh, conflict at the center of the poem, and will there be resolution or are they not? And he's he I mean in some ways he's accepted his fate, hasn't he? He's he, he's not so much angry. He's just sort of you know okay I, I give up. Yeah, I've kind of given up. And just leave me alone. Don't keep bothering me. I'm not going to go with you. That's when they keep trying to get you to go. He's the, oh, well, okay, that's interesting. The West is gone. It's, it's gone down. It's gone down. I can't keep up. I can't join you. And of course, he did, but he did it in, rather than in poetry, which makes him so unique. The romantic poet who didn't want to be one, but he couldn't get out of it in poetry. Tennyson could, right? Because like I said, the, the early parts of In Memoriam sound a little bit like these poems. But he's able to shake that off, ring out the old, ring in the new, and is able to join in that post-millennial kingdom. So, Arnold's maybe a little bit more like Hamlet, going his whole life to appear not to be in his poetry, except he can't, like, make up his mind. That's, that's true, I guess. You're, you're right. He is somebody. He is someone who's stranded. He can't, because he can't, he, the, thing, the trouble is, if he could be a happy romantic, that would be great. But he can't be a happy romantic. He can only be a melancholy romantic. But he can't join the Victorian age. So that, yeah. Either way, he's stuck in the middle. Have, 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 you, have any of you felt that you were born at the wrong time? Should have been a little earlier or a little later or something. You're sort of stuck in transition. Maybe I don't know. You feel that way? Yeah. yeah maybe that's what would be better. That's cool stuff. <laughs> I grew up in the seventies, the most pathetic, most pathetic decade in history. But the uh, I know, but it was it, what I'm saying it was bad. It was just kind of pathetic. Look at the way we dressed, like with polyester suits. I mean, it was just sad. Yeah, I guess it did. That that was the one redeeming thing. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. All right, let us move on to Thomas Hardy. If you think you're depressed now, oh boy, let's get more depressed. Page uh, 50, uh, no, no, page, oh no, it is, page 52, um, it's the poem called Hap by Thomas Hardy. Oh, you couldn't find it? Oh, because he, yeah, because we moved from the, the second book to the third book. Oh, I guess I would think about it. that's right, yeah. It used to be one book, it's gotten so big they broke it into three. And it's weird because it used to be one book. It, those three books used to have continuous pagination to match up with the one big book. But now they've started. That's why for a second, well, no, that's right, it's 52. Um, now, of course, Thomas Hardy is most famous for? Yeah, he's a novelist. Okay. You like that one? And they, they, his books get increasingly depressing. So you get to Jude the Obscure. It's just, it's just, I mean, it's just more and more depressing, right? And so, has, have any of you had uh, Dr. Wilson, Donnie Wilson? Did she, did, did she talk in your class? Because she talks a lot about realism and naturalism, right? And what's the difference? Okay, in realism, again, it's, it's like I said, very realistic, showing the plight of the poor and things like that. But it sort of bleeds over into naturalism when it's not just about, you know, death and despair. In a naturalistic novel, it's almost like the characters are sort of pressed down into nature. You're, you're like you, it's, it's very Darwinian, let's put it that way. And we become part of this whole cycle. And they just get really depressing because there's not, there's not much overarching hope. And we, and, and I mean, they're, they're, they're fun to read as a sort of, uh, you know, uh, just <laughs> let out, you know, almost like a catharsis, but it's not a catharsis that leads anywhere. There's not, there's not usually, okay, who are the naturalist novels in, in America? Okay, have you ever read Stephen Crane? 
What is it, Maggie, a girl in the streets? Or you've read, uh, have you ever read uh, Theodore Dreiser, Sister Carrie? Or maybe, maybe some of you've read Jack London? You probably know Jack London. He can be pretty naturalistic. Or who's the other one? Uh, Frank Norris, who wrote uh, The Octopus and some other books. Okay, these are these are pretty. And in France, they would include Zola, some of the French novels, where they they. Okay, we watch the disintegration of our characters, but we watch it with almost a scientific accuracy, like a Darwinian scientist looking at natural selection. And 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 again, it, it just gets. Uh, sometimes there's a little hope at the end, but there's a lot of despair. But like I said, what what makes it more naturalistic is. You know, that, that grand sense of you know, free will and all that sort of stuff, we sort of get pressed into the cycles and rhythms of nature. Um, and and uh, again, it, 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 it's an acquired taste, if you like it or not, right? But what's really cool about Thomas Hardy is you would have thought he would have began as a poet and then ended as a novelist, but it's actually the opposite. He wrote his novels first, and as, as I understand, he just kept annoying his readers so much till they all just revolted after Jude the Obscure, and he just stopped. Although the movie Jude the Obscure is pretty good with Kate Winslet. Um, you know that? I think it's just called Jude uh, with Kate Winslet. Um, yeah, they just wrote. Yeah, they wrote. And then he turned over to poetry. And, you know, he's, he's famous for writing pretty long novels. Uh, they got longer, Trust in the D'Urbervilles, they got longer and longer. But his poems, that's, that's him too. Okay, and, and yeah, but far from the landing crowd, return of the native, Tess, Jude the obscure, mayor of Casterbridge, and that may be all of them, just about all. Yeah, the same place. It's, it's like this fictional place, but it's really based on you know real area. Because you know, there's an old version of Far from the Manding Crowd with Julie Christie that's very good. If you haven't seen that, um, from the 50s, I think maybe or 60s. Um, but but anyway, it's interesting that. At the end of his life, he turned to poetry, and all of his poetry, almost all of it's very, very short, lyrical poetry. And it's wonderful, because if you want to understand Thomas Hardy's you know, worldview, you don't have to wade through the novels. Just read a few of these poems, and it's got it. It's like, finally, finally. That's what I generally think almost all novels are too long. Uh, actually, at least half, half of the movies made are too long, too. Uh, but novels are almost always too long. Uh, Oh, yeah, it depends. You're like, Lord of the Rings, no, that, that, that had to be longer, as, as he said. That, yeah, that's the problem. It should have been longer. But the, uh, but we're going to get all of all of what you can get, sort of thematically, is condensed. And like I said, we can understand this first poem. We'll, we'll understand this mood that's sort of the end of the 19th century into the beginning of the 20th century. We often call this early modernism, right? And in some ways, it is. It's high Victorianism, uh, but it's Okay, okay, Victorianism, as you get into the 1890s, it just slowly starts to get, you know, it, it like loses its hope and its faith and it starts to crumble a little bit, right, as you move into that. And then when you get to World War One, it really kills everything. Um, yeah, that didn't turn out well. But the, uh, at the end of the age, there was what they called a malaise, right? But let's look at this poem and understand it's called hap. And hap means like by happenstance or by chance. And really, ultimately, this is this is a sonnet. You see, it's fourteen lines, four, four, six. It doesn't exactly follow either the Petrarchan or the or the Shakespearean, but it is ultimately a sonnet, four, four, six. Right? And what's that? The Volta. Oh, good. Oh, that's right. Yeah, the, the, you're right. The little sting in the adder's tail, uh, like uh, like a Shakespearean sonnet. And in this poem, it's very simple. He works out. A little sort of proof. And notice it's if, then, but. So, if but some vengeful God would call to me from up the sky and laugh, thou suffering thing, know that thy sorrow is my ecstasy, that thy love's loss is my hate's profiting. If that were the case, then would I bear it, clench myself and die, steeled by the sense of ire unmerited, Half eased in that a powerfuller than I had willed and meted me the tears I shed. So, if I knew God was like what? How is he depicting God here? In the first stanza. Good. He was angry. Sinners in the hands of an angry God. No, that, that, that sermon's misunderstood. First of all, he starts by saying, I'm not talking to those of you that are already in Christ. I'm talking to you outside. They always make it sound like you know they were all crazy and never knew when they were saved. I mean, it's not what he says. But anyway, the uh, 
if I found out that God was a true cosmic bully, or what is Lewis, uh, 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 cos- uh, wait, cosmic sadist, a divine vivisectionist, remember that clear? That's in, that's in the grief observed. If I discovered that God was just you know, cruel and actually took joy in my pain, then how would I deal with that? That's the second stanza. Or we call it like quatrain. Well, how would, what would he do? Good. And that's exactly right. I would resign to it. I would. Actually, you're right. Then I'll just clench my fist, right? And I remember one of the first times I taught this, I said, What do you clench? You can clench your teeth, you can clench your fists. And then, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's just really funny because when I asked the one girl said, your buttocks? And I'm like, well, yeah, you do clench your buttocks, but that wasn't the first thing that came to my mind, right? But anyway, you do. I mean, you can clench all different parts of your, your body. But I, I love it when he says, the, uh, then I would bear it, clench myself. So imagine if you, you know, clench, clench, and then like your whole body was clenched, right? Yeah. And then... Yeah. yeah, and it's hard. You can't sleep them when you're all clenched. You need to... Uh, and people tell me, like, uh, if you grind your teeth and different things like that, that if you, like, learn to do a little bit of sort of meditation and what you have to do is, like, like uh, loosen your toes and, like, work your way all the way up your body that you'll sleep well. But have you ever been able to do that? Uh, no, but I haven't told you. I don't think I have enough patience to do that. Or maybe, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, and then, and then oh. Good, and that doesn't work, so just stretch. The stretch. What you do is practice the Jesus prayer, right? And as a monk once told me, then either you become holy or you fall asleep. So it's, it's good either way. You just do a repetitive prayer. Yeah, that's the teeth. The devil wants you to not pray, so you fall asleep. There we go. So at least you fell asleep, right? <laughs> but the, so again, this is the if then, but this is not where the poem ends. But not so. In other words, it's not so. God is not a simple, vengeful, cosmic bully that actually takes joy. This is what God's really like. And this is, this is the naturalistic view that we see in his novels and so many others. But not so. How arrives it joy lies slain? And why unblooms the best hope ever sown? Crass casualty obstructs the sun and rain. And dicing time for gladness casts a moan. These purblind doomsters had as readily strown blisses about my pilgrimage as pain. So, if I knew that God was just evil and was a bogey God, I could just clinch and just deal with it, right? But, oh, that's a good one. Yeah, that's right. Um, you know, defiance. Defiance. I remember, uh, um, okay, my father and uncle both owned gas stations, and they were like opposites. My father's was all, you know, logical and ordered, and my uncle, everybody was crazy. They were all playing jokes on each other. I mean, they, they, they did fix cars, but they all played jokes on each other. And I'll never forget, it sticks in my mind, my uncle had this wonderful poster in his, uh, in, in his office. It was a big poster, and it was this giant eagle. And the eagle was swooping down to devour this little mouse who was in the corner of it, right? So he's down the corner. And the, 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 the caption says, when all else fails, try an act of defiance. And if you look really carefully, you'll see that the mouse is giving a finger. So it's swooping down. So that's it. Try an act of defiance when all else fails. That's, that's what I'll do. Byronic hero, right? In the face. Okay. So... But that's, but that's not what it's like. What is, what is God, God actually like? In the, in the third part. He's not really evil. He's just what? Say it again. Well, he, he does slay, but he's, he's just... Yeah, it's just, you know, he's just arbitrary. He's uncaring. He's callous. He doesn't care. He could, he could just as well throw... Happiness as as pain on me. He doesn't really care. Uh, isn't there an epic? Yeah, and his whim. Good, the whims. Like, um, did you all see the original Clash of the Titans? Remember what they're doing? What are the gods doing? Yeah, the chess men. And then whatever they do there goes down there. They're playing with them, right? They're they're not. Oh yeah. <clears throat> Oh, that's right. Yeah. Like, oh, yeah. like, 
Yeah. yeah. And the, the other one, he throws down and turns him into a monster. Remember? Uh, that's the Caliban, or his name is. The, um... Calabos? Calabos. which is the name of the evil variant Sleeping Beauty, I think. Oh, and it's similar to Caliban in, in, uh, in uh, Tempest. But it's Calibos, that's right. It's the evil variant from Sleeping Beauty. Oh, yeah, okay. Calabos. That was the but anyway, it's more similar to one than the other. Okay. I mean, Kalabas sounds more Greek when you put an O at, like Marcos. I mean, most Greek names have an O-S at the end, uh, like that, so you can tell. But, uh, but here, it is, it's uncaring, it, God is arbitrary, he just, now, can anybody think of it, Melly? Did you just read an epic where at the end somebody suggests an image of Zeus that seems a little bit arbitrary and uncaring? Do you remember? Do you remember? Iliad, Iliad book 24, 24, very end of the Iliad. Do you remember what Achilles says to, um, to Priam? That Zeus has what at his throne? Do you remember? Oh, yes. Remember that? Good, two jars. Ah, sometimes you pick it up and throw it. Sometimes it's down there. And whatever he does, you're happy or miserable. We just have to deal with it. And it's really funny because in the beginning of the Odyssey, in the beginning of the Odyssey, it's almost like Zeus has just read Book 24 of the Iliad. said, no, don't give me that bad propaganda press. He says, it's your fault. I warned to just this, not to take that woman for you know, his wife. And he paid for it when he got killed, when Orestes came back. So it's literally as if Book 1 of the Odyssey is in dialogue with Book 24 of the Iliad. Well, another reason to say it was the same author. Um, but here, again, we got these purblind do. It's funny, because we always think of the image of uh, justice as blind. But of course, that's, that's supposed to mean that justice is objective, yeah. right? You know, you know isn't there one, what, is there one in front of the Supreme Court or something? You see the statues, you know, where, where she's holding the scales and she's blind. Again, the idea being objective. But here, it's a blindness that's not objectivity. It's a blindness that is uncaring. It's as, it's as uncaring and, and arbitrary as nature. It's just like, oh, you know, kind of the way that... Uh, Tennyson feels in number 45, 45, 40, 54, 55, 56 of In Memoriam when he says, you know, out of, out of 100 seeds, only one lives and the other 99 dies and nature doesn't care, right? Just let it all go. I, I don't care. In fact, let, let whole species go extinct. I don't care. That's, that's the scarier, or, or another word for this is the stoic God. Most of you, I think, have read the, the Aeneid. Uh, Dido rages not only against Aeneas, but she rages against what fit employment for heaven's high powers. You stoic gods that don't seem to care about human pain or joy. You're just carrying out, you know, you're, you're stoic. Like, well, you still still use that word today. Uh, that the gods are stoic like that. Oh, that's good. We get stuck in the like poor Octavia. We get stuck in the middle. Good. Good. It is interesting. And they are here. Here, this God doesn't even have emotions. I mean, this is like this is even worse than that. But that's true. And, and it's it's. And no, no, there's just really a funny thing. Can somebody tell me what the rhyme scheme is of the first quatrain? It's A B A B. What about what about the second stanza? It's also A B A B. And then the first four lines of the of the the next stanza are also A B A B. Right. Slain, sown, rain, moan, A, B, A, B. So what would you have expected the, the last two lines to be? Wouldn't you expect them to continue the A, B? Right? But what does it do? Whoop! It flips around. Arbitrarily becomes B, A. So that's, that's kind of a neat way that he carries across his point partly by the... the, 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 the the prosody, you know, they, 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 that he's matching the form to the content, maybe is the best way to say it. He's got a certain thematic content, and he expresses it formally by that sort of seemingly arbitrary reversal, where it's all along it's been A, B, A, B, and then suddenly it's A, B, A, B, B, A, turned around. Nobody cares. So that, again, maybe the simple way, in Hardy, God is neither good nor evil. He's indifferent. It's arbitrary. He's riddling. 
uh, you're, you're not going to find any answer. There's not going to be a true Aristotelian catharsis. There will be no enlightenment or clarification at the end of this. Okay, that's a good way, right? It's just, it's just, it's pathetic rather than tragic, right? You know, like, like tragic is, you know, you're, you're almost at the end and then you just lose in the last second and it's tragic, but you still know that you've worked hard and you can celebrate. Yeah, yeah, pathetic would be like, I don't know, the, the Houston Texans or something like that, right? It's pathetic. It used to be. Uh, before that, there was a team called the, the, the Titans. I don't even know if you were alive yet. The Houston, uh, yeah, Houston Titans. And uh, they, uh, no, I'm sorry, the Houston Oilers. I'm sorry, they became the Titans. The Houston Oilers. And I mean, they would like literally be winning 30 to nothing, and then they would lose. It was unbelievable. There we go, yeah, it's, <laughs> no, okay, there we go. Maybe. I mean, that's, that's pathetic. I mean, we, we we don't. There's no like like West Side Story. It's it's tragic, right? At, at the end, there is they, they've learned something, right? The gangs have come together and whatnot, and it's terrible, like in Romeo and Juliet. But they learn something. The, the Capulets and Montagues come together. There's some kind of tragic wisdom game, or even after Oedipus or Antigone. Uh, but this is more what we call pathos. There's there's no you haven't really learned anything. You're, you're just you're just stuck, stuck. and you're ground right. down slowly by it. Uh, uh, and again, it's just, uh, 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 like I said, in France, it was uh, 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 Zola or Balzac. Have you ever heard of him? Chaucer, Rabelais, Balzac. You know what that's from? Oh, come on, that's the music man, anyway. She advocates dirty books. You have to see the music man, it's great. I know, yeah, a lot of them are, are thick books, but but again, it, it but it was a, it was a big deal uh, for a while. One of my favorites is the Octopus uh, by Frank Norris. Okay, look at page fifty-two for neutral tones. I hope none of you will break up with well, oh, I hope none of you will break up with your boyfriend this way, or in this case, that your boyfriend will break up with you. Okay, I, I hope you're not the girl in neutral tones. This this girl pops up a lot. She's the same girl, not literally, but the same girl in Dover Beach, the sort of heartless one. And, and again, heartless, heartless, you say, heartless doesn't always mean cruel. Heartless can just mean, again, heart, like, like you just don't care. Thoughtless. I think that's a good way to put it. It doesn't necessarily mean actively cruel, just thoughtless. Right? And, and, and he's about to break up with this girl that, you know, that, that they couldn't care less. She's deceived him. But it, it, what makes it so disturbing is there's such a flatness to it. Uh, you, you probably know this, that, that uh, I think his name is Anthony Hecht wrote a, a sequel to Dover Beach called The Dover Bitch. And it's from her point of view. It's really funny, you know. <laughs> it's really funny. But you can, you, can, you can Google it. You'll find it. Yeah, what's that? Oh, is there? Oh, okay, that's true. That's kind of neat. Yeah, that's just a little while ago, actually. Oh, from her point of view, yeah. Oh, that's right. Which is so interesting. But on the other hand, you often lose any sense of morality in the same way that when we have hmm. all like sort of stories now from the point of view of the villain. Oh, that's true. You're right. Yeah. Sympathetic character. Yes, that's how the people of Crossroads are. But then you take away any sense of true evil and the fact that evil exists as a concept. So it's very interesting. Yeah, yeah, it's true. Like Maleficent or something like that when you see... And it's really funny. Ma Ma Maleficent... How, how could we believe that Maleficent was originally good when her name is Maleficent? Okay, anyway. Maybe that's why people don't want to hang out with you, girl. Anyway, your name is Maleficent. Okay. The... <laughs> yeah, I know, but she's Maleficent from the beginning. <laughs> it's crazy stuff. Anyway, but the um, okay, so here again, this is this is a breakup, but a breakup that's been drained. I mean, neutral tones. It's been drained of all of its. You know, at least if they were yelling at each other and they can move, but it's a, there's a sort of deadness that he captures in this poem. And what to me makes it even more disturbing. What, what's the rhyme scheme? Yeah, did we read anything off A B B A? It's the in memoriam thing. Yeah. So yeah, I, well, he probably, I, I would say he probably had that in mind because he's very conscious in all of his poems of his form. Uh, Thomas Hardy. They're all very formal, and they're formal in a thoughtful way, like Shelley, where sometimes, like he's really careful about the stanza form. So, we. This is the speak. Go ahead. Oh, isn't that great? Okay. So, like when you chide somebody, kick them out, right? 
These, these, they, they, they're right. They stick in your mind, and they're, they're kind of troubling, but they, they are right. And again, it, it's so simple. His poems are so simple. You know, his, his, his prose is more elaborate. Yeah. Oh, look at that. We stood by a pond that winter day, and the sun was white as the chitin of God who was outcast, and a few leaves lay on the starving sod. They had fallen from an ash. This is, that was, one time I sat in your class, uh, Maria, with, with uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Bolston. He would kind of take your, your poem, not just you, the others, and like strip it of as many adjectives as you could, right? Things like that. And straight, and this, this is stripped down. I mean, it, it's so bare and naked, but, but powerful. Um, and again, there, there's, no fan, there's not much fancy diction, uh, but it, 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 paints, it paints a picture with neutral colors. Where, where, again, it, it's like, and you know, sometimes they do this. I've, I've seen some movies where they might have a sequence in black and white, but instead of it being true black and white, it's filmed in color, and then they drain the color out of it because they, they want to. They're, they're saying something. Because black and white can be very optimistic if it's done properly, but this is, you know, purposely, it's a world drained of color, uh, drained of emotion, and the, uh, the, uh, you know, again, it, 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 you just don't care. Uh, your eyes on me were as eyes that rove over tedious riddles of years ago. Oh, just break up. And some and some words played between and some words played between us to and fro, on which lost the more by our love. The smile on your mouth was the deadest thing, alive enough to have strength to die, and a grin of bitterness swept thereby like an ominous bird on the wing. Again, if, if they were yelling at each other, this would be less disturbing, okay? But it is drained of emotion. The, your smile was <laughs> alive enough, alive enough to drink to die. <laughs> Just enough. Ooh. I hope none of you are going to be this girl. Please, please, please assure me. Yeah, because they're saying the boyfriend. That's just bad for you as a person. Yeah. You don't, want to, you don't want to do that, okay? But like I said, she seems to have been the same girl in Dover Beach. Okay, she just gets around. <laughs> she's just, you know, again, it, 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 again, what makes this so disturbing is it's so matter of fact. It's not melodrama. It's like an opera where, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm suffering and the girl's destroying me, but I'm singing. It, it's, it's so matter of fact. Like, like you've had, you know what the phrase flat affect is? Like some, when you've had an, an, a lobotomy. You're just sort of flat. Yeah, yeah monotone. monotone is good word. And, and that's why it's neutral tones. You know, not only is the color monotone, but the tone is monotone, right? And he's doing that on purpose. It's not because he, and again, and again we, we feel it uh, in a dead way. And then the last stanza is actually surprising the more you know about Wordsworth. Since then, keen lessons that love deceives and rings with wrong have shaped to me your face and the God cursed sun and a tree. And, and a pond edged with grayish leaves. Now, now this, this is even more. We didn't read the prelude, but I mentioned that Wordsworth, uh, Wordsworth wrote a long autobiography. And in the autobiography, he coins the phrase spots of time, which is almost an oxymoron. There's a spots of time, right? Uh, and he, he shows that there were moments from his early childhood when he had some kind of sudden intercourse with nature that just... That that, that that was like a seed that went into him and strengthened him. And almost all of his spots of time are moments where the imagery is very, very simple. I'll, I'll just read it to you really quickly, uh, an example of it from that. He says, There are ex in our existence spots of time which with distinct preeminence retain a renovating virtue. They go in there. And this is one he talks about when he was a young boy and he was with some companions and they were going down a hill, and somehow he got cut off from his companions. And they ended up going down the hill. And he was really scared, and then he came upon an old gibbet. In other words, where you hang a person. And, and anyway, all of that just sort of shocked him and put him in a strange mood. And then he turned, and this is what he saw, he says, as he was coming back and reascending the bare common, saw a naked pool that lay beneath the hills, the beacon on the summit, 
and more near a girl who bore a pitcher on her head and seen with difficult steps to force her way against the blowing wind. It was, in truth, an ordinary sight, but I should need colors and words that are unknown to man to paint the visionary dreariness which, while I looked all round for my lost guide, did at that time invest the naked pool, the beacon on the lonely eminence, the woman and her garments vexed and tossed by the strong wind. See, it's that same denuded landscape, sort of just uh, reduced down to its essence. But that image went into him and became a, a seed that he could call back to renovate him, like, like the images of the Y Valley, right? I've not been to me as a blind man, uh, as a landscape to a blind man. Another one, just, just to show you the imagery, uh, another one that happened when he was very young, these, these are the images he focuses on. He says... Uh, I sate half sheltered by a naked wall. Upon my right hand was a single sheep, a whistling hawthorn on my left, and there with those companions at my side, I watched. So he clearly has Wordsworth in mind. But whereas this sort of stark landscape brings what he calls visionary jury, think of the Moors, right? Wuthering Heights. It, it, it is dreary, but there's a visionary dreariness to it. There, there, it, it all of this, this denuded landscape is invested with a kind of visionary power that sustains him. Here in the party poem, it's not visionary dreariness, it's just dreary. Okay? It doesn't, and every time he remembers back to that imagery, it doesn't renovate him and connect him again, it reminds him again that love deceives. And that there, oh love, let us be true to one another. Remember again, Dover Beach. And so, all it does is push him further into a kind of dead despair. So, if you want to call this a dark side to the spots of time, this image has been implanted in me, but it's not an image I can go back to to restore myself. It's an image I go back to that will remind me again and again uh, how, uh, you know. Um, you can't trust love. You can't trust relationships. You can't trust any of these things. Uh, and so, I don't know, it's, it's, it's kind of scary. And again, it's pathetic rather than tragic. I mean, it's, it's just it's a sort of giving up of life. Nah, we can talk more about that. But, but we'll look at a few more poems uh, next class. Uh, some really good ones. The Darkling Thrush, which is his version of a romantic bird poem. Uh, and then, we'll, then we're going to see one that was written on the eve of World War One, And then one that's written about the Titanic. Isn't that cool? So they all have a key. The, the Darkling Thrush is the last day of the uh, of the 19th century. So it's really cool stuff. Good, Good job, job, folks. All right.